Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Today, everything you see is for sale. Reach out to this email address, tmosso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Watch names, references, and when available prices are in the description below and we are buying. We're always looking to stock up and if you want to sell a watch or a full collection with no upper limit on value paid, reach out to me, tmosso at thewatchbox.com to get the ball rolling. Let's jump straight in with a big piece. From H. Moser and C, this is the third series of the Endeavor Flying Hours. This is the Endeavor Flying Hours Super Luminova Blue, a timepiece with a variation on the late Renaissance clock concept, wandering hours, a little bit like an Urwerk or an AP star wheel, you can see that it has a distinct difference in that there's a central sapphire disc representing the minutes, and then the individual stations of the hours pivot on central axes that rotate as the minutes advance. Now, what really sets this one apart isn't the fact that it has a unique and captivating complication, or the handsome combination of black, blue, and a few you may palladium style dial or even the white gold case or the limited edition of 100 pieces this watch is spectacular at night as you can see the luminova blue lives up to its name a spectacular piece as animated in the dark as it is in the light, with an automatic winding three-day power reserve and H. Moser and C's signature Fumé dial with their own take on the wandering hours. They call it flying hours. Now, jumping from independence to the most institutional and establishment of horology, Rolex, but a wacky one. This watch was launched at Basel in 2016, and I remember it distinctly, the 116-900 Air King. The Air King had traditionally been a smaller watch. Think 34 millimeters, think entry level, very basic, discreet, almost a mini Oyster Perpetual with a more charismatic dial. Well, at a full 40 millimeters, this model is not just literally a mechanical and body double to the Milgauss. They have the same inner anti-magnetic equipment, but you can see that it's a funky take on the traditional Explorer dial with tri-Arabic numerals, all Arabic numeral minute and second calibration, black, white, yellow, and green on a dial that actually represents the design Rolex created for the Bloodhound supersonic car program. So the supersonic car program never quite got off the ground or on the ground, so to speak, but the designs that Rolex coined for its instruments in the cockpit, they gave birth to this Air King. Now, as I mentioned, the watch does have a soft iron cage around the movement, just like the Milgauss, with the same escapement and niobium zirconium blue oxidized anti-magnetic hairspring. It is a gorgeous piece, and it's only about 13 millimeters thick. Without a rotating bezel, it actually slides easily under a cuff. It is the consummate play hard, work hard watch, as it could be a dress watch, but it's easily a sports option. Now, I'm going to go back for a moment to the Endeavor Flying Hours, because I didn't give you a wrist shot. Guys, if you're new to the program, my wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference. You can see this one's nice and thin. It's about 12.8 millimeters thick, so it will slide underneath the cuff. It's a sporty dress watch. I think that's the best way to describe it. And as you can see, the case contours, as always with Moser, are absolutely impeccable. Black polished, concave, vertically satin finished, concave bezel uh, that expands at 12 and six. It is a fluid and gorgeous case form. Now, speaking of fluid and gorgeous cases, I have to admit that Rolex's super case has never been accused of being fluid, but gorgeous. Well, sometimes there's just more to love, and that's the case. The watch is 40 millimeters, and this is the GMT Master II that debuted in 2018, the first ever rose gold GMT Master. The timepiece features a root beer style bezel. It is the 126715 CHNR, and it has that bezel with a ceramic insert in both brown and black with rose gold deposits for the numerals and the indices, and you're able to read temporarily three time zones on this pilot's watch. Remember, the originals were developed by Rolex for Pan Am pilots. They they could display two time zones at a time. This one can display up to three. It's a chronometer. It has a three-day power reserve. It's 100 meters water resistant, all of which means it is a very, very versatile watch. When you pop open the clasp and throw it on the wrist, you can see, though, it feels like it's worth a million dollars in terms of solidity. 
you don't need an outsized wrist to wear it. Now, it does look like a bigger watch because of that super case with its squared off lugs and its sheer side, but note how low it sits on the wrist. This will slide underneath the cuff, and I think my cuff is instructive in that regard. Plenty of clearance on both sides of the wrist, 14 centimeter circumference wrists, probably the lower limit for wearing this watch a lot of personality here. Now jumping to the last in of our trio, it is the most elemental but possibly the most exciting as this is the 2020 redesign of the lovely Oyster Perpetual in 41 millimeters. You can see that it has a handsome combination of 41 millimeter case, domed bezel, a silver satin sunburst dial with yellow gold indices, hands, and Rolex crown. The timepiece is substantial in a way the Oyster Perpetual historically has not been. I don't want you to confuse it with the Milgauss though. Even though it's a millimeter larger, you can see there is a big difference in thickness and that the Oyster Perpetual is a much thinner, more graceful watch on the wrist. Now you can see that to good effect. Never has an Oyster Perpetual had this much presence, been this broad or this flat. The aspect ratio is incredibly handsome as the timepiece is like a sliver on the wrist, but broad, almost more like a cushion profile case than a round case. It's 100 meters water resistant. It has the three-day power reserve. It's shock resistant, highly anti-magnetic, and very well loomed. I'm going to do a quick loom shot for this one because I want to demonstrate just how great is its versatility. And we're back with the OP41. You can see the blue Rolex proprietary material, of course, chromolite, they call it. And it gives the watch a lovely, almost ethereal appearance, almost like a close encounters type experience at night. Now, that is Rolex for the day. And I think my favorite of the three is probably going to be the Air King for its sheer wackiness. But we have plenty of excitement on deck because we're going back to Moser now, and we're talking about the Pioneer Center Seconds Cosmic Green. Now this is 42.8 millimeters in stainless steel, and with the screw down crown, this is a 120 meter water resistant sports watch. Do a quick loom shot here. And you can see it is a true sports watch in every regard, easily legible after dark. Now, the watch is big, but it's not overbearing, and it features Moser's characteristic Fumé dial. We got a little bit of that on the, the flying hours, but because the dial is segmented with different colors, you don't get the full effect. Here, you have that fade from cosmic green at the center to almost black at the edge. There's a chapter ring outboard that mounts the loomed indices, and then inboard, you have rhodium-plated steel diamond-polished applique indices that look like a million dollars. No date, minimal printing, minimal branding, and then a case that maintains Moser's tradition of handsome case profile. Profiles. They're almost always hollowed out in a distinctive fashion. Here, rather than a mirrored concave profile, we have a lovely coined recess on both sides of the watch. And you can see that the case itself is polished in profile and nicely rounded, but it has a character line running down the lug hoods with satin finish on the peaks of the lugs and then a polished domed style bezel wrapping around the crown. The timepiece, of course, features an HMC 200 automatic movement bi-directional winding with a magic lever style system that's both very shock tolerant and very efficient. You can see this three-day power reserve automatic movement also includes a full balance bridge and a free sprung index, which makes it very, very shock tolerant. You'll also know that Moser has a recessed bolt aerodynamic free sprung balance design. Not only do they design it, they make it. They make their escapement, their hairspring, and their balance, making them one of the few manufacturers that actually produces the most sensitive and specialized components of the watch. That is truly rare. Moser, of course, always with the design, featuring the same ridged coining on the buckle that you see on the case flank. Two and 40 millimeters from F.P. Journe, neither one of them ordinary. Let's start out with the watch that came out in 2019 and ran only 2019, a one-year model, sometimes known informally as the Resonance 4. This was the 2019 F.P. Journe Chronomet à Resonance, a timepiece 40 millimeters in rose gold with a solid rose gold dial and a solid rose gold movement. The effect of that is to create a very heavy 40 millimeter watch that feels like something special and looks like it too. If you get close to the dial, you can see that the change from the Resonance 3 was that it went back to the symmetrical 
dial geometry of the resonance 1 and 2. But rather than a 12-12 dial, it has a 24-hour dial and a 12-hour dial, so you can truly use that second time zone, which is independently settable, as a reference time for a time zone where you are not. Power reserve indicator, both sides have 42 hours of power reserve, and because the resonance phenomenon requires about 7 to 10 minutes to couple the two sides of the movement, there's no actual physical link between them, uh, the seconds hands might be out of sync by the time they are synchronized and resonating. So what you can do is you can use the flyback trigger down at 4 o'clock to synchronize the seconds hands. Now the movement is gorgeous, and this is the rule with F. Pijorn. 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates, so everything is not just executed at an engineering level. It's, it's hard to do that with gold, as soft as it is, but it's also executed on an aesthetic level. So these have to be functional mechanical components, but also beautifully made with the Cote de Genève running laterally, black polish in abundance on the screws, as well as on the a rack system and the pinion holder for adjusting the distance between the balance. That's so the watchmaker can tune the resonance phenomenon. You have a uh, lovely mirrored anglage. Your anglage is getting better and better every year, and then there's engine turning on the base plate with satin on the wheels. Now what I really love here is the fact that you have a power reserve with a barrel, a drivetrain, an escapement, and a balance, then you have another one. In the same case, a separate movement. Barrel, drivetrain, escapement, and balance. The only thing that couples them together is the phenomenon of resonance. Previously established with metronomes and pendulum clocks, it had never been executed in a wristwatch until F. P. Journe achieved it in his original chronomet of Isenolce in 2000. So if you're gonna buy a Journe watch, a lot of folks say get the resonance, which was a world premiere, or get the tourbillon. Souffren. The Tourbillon Souffren is a timepiece, 40 millimeters in platinum. This example, black label. So the descendant of F.P. Journe's first own brand watch, the 1999 Tourbillon Remontoir, this is the 40 millimeter version of the Tourbillon Souverain, but black label, which means that it's only available at a boutique or a spa, and then only to a prior purchaser of a new F.P. Journe watch. More than that, only two examples of any given model can be made black label per year, so it's exclusive. It's also gorgeous. Black label means platinum case and a black dial, exclusive to this line. Now, as you get closer to the dial, and I'll get as close as I can, you can see that the Tourbillon try to focus on that tourbillon there. The tourbillon is gorgeous. It's a one-minute tourbillon that is free-sprung, adjusted in six positions, has an overcoil hairspring, which is exceptionally rare for Journe watches, as very few and only very special Journe watches get the overcoil rather than the flat hairspring. Now, you can also see that there is a polished steel bezel framing the time as well as the tourbillon, and the watch features a deadbeat second indication with the tourbillon effectively acting as scroll seconds. You can also see that the tourbillon carriage is all black polished, and the half bridge for the upper tourbillon carriage is also completely rounded and specular finished. Power reserve is 42 hours, but the watch will default back to scroll seconds and deactivate its primary refinement, the Remontoire de Galate, when the watch is at approximately 12 hours of power reserve remaining. The Remontoire, more than anything else, is responsible for the precision of this watch. The barrel never directly drives the tourbillon in the escapement. Rather, this linear titanium spring stores up one second bursts of barrel energy, and then via a secondary escapement with a locking pallet, as you can see, there's a little release mechanism under my finger, it both drives drives the deadbeat second display on the front of the watch and ensures that until the last 12 hours of power reserve, the balance of the amplitude of this watch remains constant, which allows it to be adjusted very, very precisely to run incredibly regular, which is why you want to wind this watch on a daily basis. Now, throwing it on the wrist, it's handsome. It's not thick, it's not broad, and because it's only 48 millimeters lug to lug, I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. Now, jumping back to the chronomet of Isenolce real quick, you can see that it too wears just about the same, easily sliding under a cuff, not a problem there, but with a warmer overall ambiance, demeanor, and aesthetic, a really handsome piece, especially with the rare blue printing on the dial. You can see that the dial's been printed in blue, and that is a feature only found on special watches. Journe intended this for, to be a one-year commemorative model, and thus it has blue printing on its dial. Now, if we want to go absolutely spectacular, let's go with the 2013 GPHG Aiguidor winner. Effectively, the winner of Best Picture at the Oscars of Watchmaking. Now, that original Gerard Perigo Constant Escapement LM was a 48mm watch. This 
came out in 2016 in titanium, it's the 46 millimeter. That doesn't mean it's small, it just means it's smaller. Now, the timepiece is extraordinary, not because of its size, but because of its technical virtuosity. Take a quick look at this dial. Let's get as close as we can. You can see there are two wheels. There's a rocker that's impulsing the balance, and then there's an almost invisible silicon spring, a linear spring, that acts as a constant force device, much like the linear spring on the Remontoir de Galate, the constant force device on the Journe. You can see that linear spring is a little bit different than this one, because this one made of silicon has effectively infinite elasticity. There is no metal fatigue, so it can bend back and forth as the escapement beats away at 21,600 vibrations per hour, and it can do that day after day, year after year, with no fatigue or stress. What happens here is that the impulsing wheels with those tri-spokes, they actually tap the spring, the linear spring, and beyond a certain point, it will snap as if you'd held a playing card between your hands and then bent it until it snapped, pressed it in the other direction, and watched it snap back. So it's not the energy of the two mainspring barrels. You can see it has two mainspring barrels. It's actually the energy that's conveyed from the barrel to the spring and then from the spring to the balance. So because the spring always stores and releases the same amount of energy when it's bent and snapped, it will deliver the same same amount of force and energy to the escapement for six days, and that is why this is called the constant escapement. Using the technology that allows this large silicon component to be crafted, and keep in mind that little hair-like spring across the center is integral. It is a monoblock part. This is the kind of thing that can only be created with deep reactive ion etching. This was originally a Rolex project, and the gentleman Nicolas Dehon, who originally designed the system for Rolex, Rolex, left Rolex after Rolex failed to finish the patent, took the idea to Gerard Perrigo, and armed with the arrival of silicon technology, was able to finish it for this watch, and it is spectacular. As you can see on the dial side, you have bridges that echo Gerard Perrigo's eternal design icon, the Golden Bridge. Turn it over again, and you can see on the reverse side, likewise, that bridge motif. The movement, like a langa, has incredible depth, and it is handsomely finished in a high horology standard. So though it looks almost techno-industrial with its grayscale aesthetic, the closer you get, the more you admire the beveling, the satination, and the black polished screws. Now, I'm going to throw this on my wrist, which you know is 16 centimeters. The watch is big, but it fits. The lugs are relatively stubby. I wouldn't necessarily wear it on a smaller wrist than mine, but it's very light in grade five titanium, which means it sits secure and comfortable. Big is sort of the style. It puts that unique escapement system on display. This was a landmark watch and it remains so eight years after its debut or for the 46, five years after its debut. And now, two watches from a brand we rarely discuss, Arnold and Son of La Chaux de Fonds. Let's start with a model made in 50 pieces, 44 millimeters. This is the Time Pyramid Black Edition, a watch that includes two separate power reserves and two separate mainspring barrels that converge on a single drivetrain to propel the balance. Now, it has an 80-hour power reserve, and what happens is when you wind it, the first power reserve moves to its maxed-out position, and then the second follows. As you can see, the drivetrain proceeds down from the balance to a skeletonized and golden dial with a sapphire hour track, and you can see that second sapphire bearing the hour track inboard of the golden outer chapter ring. It is a remarkably handsome watch and surprisingly thin. You can see on the reverse side the triple solarization on the ratchet wheels for the barrels, and a lovely sort of blackened aesthetic across the Côte de Genève on the underside of the bridges. It's large, it's open, it's area, and again with 50 pieces produced, it is quite scarce. Now, it wears well on my wrist. I would say the smallest wrist for this watch is probably about 15 centimeters circumference, but it's not excessively broad, and as you can see, it is quite thin for what it is. It's open, airy, ethereal, gossamer, and graceful. This is the kind of watch that Arnold & Son does so well. A true manufacturer, Arnold & Son builds everything you see in its watches. It's able to design not just the movement, but the movement to fit the case properly. As you can see, this is an expansive open and airy caliber that fills the entirety of this 44 millimeter case. Now that's spectacular, but I think I can top it because in 2016, 
Arnold and Son launched this 28-piece white gold limited edition, the TES Tourbillon Bleu. Now, as you can see, it is spectacular. If the prior watch was a showstopper, I don't even know what to say other than this is a heart stopper. This thing is incredible. Now, as you can see, the base plate for the movement is a ravishing blue galvanized and guilloche cut plate. On both sides, it has been guilloche enhanced. You can also see that there is true haute horlogerie black polish on the bevels of the individual bridges. So this is the real mirrored englage. As good as it gets, uh, Patek Philippe does no better with its bevels. You can also see black polishing. There is a skeletonized half bridge that bears the upper pivot for the tourbillon, and it has been specular finished. This is polished off at the end of the process with diamond paste, one of the hardest finishing feats to achieve, black polish or poly noir. Now, if we move up to the top of the dial, you can see that the watch features yet another inboard sapphire, just like the time pyramid. There is a sapphire that provides the upper pivot, for example, to the mainspring barrel itself, and I'll move the hands out of the way. The watch is surprisingly easy to read because the hands are half frosted for legibility and contrast. And then you can see there's that lovely open barrel. And as I wind the watch, you can see that the train winding the barrel is beautifully exposed on its own plinth at 3 o'clock, beautifully satinated across their tops. These little sub-bridges speak to the attention to the detail lavished on this watch. Now, it does have an 80 to 90 hour power reserve, which is remarkably generous for a power intensive complication like a tourbillon. And as you can see, each side of the watch lays bare, for example, the keyless works, the motion works, and the winding train. And as I operate the case back, you can see not only is the keyless works visible, but that it has been beautifully finished with beveling on the edges of the springs and levers and satination across their top. This is truly as good as it gets from one of the dyed in the wool fully credentialed, complete manufacturers in the industry. Now, this one is also 44 millimeters, but you can see here, even more than the time pyramid, the lugs are stubby. So I think you could wear this watch on a wrist as small as 14 to 15 centimeters in circumference. And once again, it is not a thick watch. What it is, is charming, colorful, and unique from possibly the best Jaeger Le Coult rival no one's ever heard of. This is a timepiece of extraordinary beauty and with 28 made rarity. Let us talk about my favorite independent. This was a 2019 novelty made in 10 pieces for the American market. It is the DB28 Kind of Gold from Debatun of Lauberson, Switzerland, a company that only makes 150 watches a year. This is a standout. It's based on their 2011 Aiguille d'Or winner at the GPHG. And as the overall winner, the DB28 was a landmark watch, just like the Girard Perigo. But unlike the Girard Perigo, this is a much more wearable timepiece. It's 42.7 millimeters in diameter, but as you can see, the lugs are spring loaded. That is to say, they are floating lugs. They have a variable geometry that conforms to your wrist. The timepiece sits easily on my wrist, and I could recommend it for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters. It is mostly fire blued grade 5 titanium, but as you can see, the crown, the hands, and the bezel are rose gold. The timepiece is absolutely stunning, but it's also thin. So while there's a lot inside, the timepiece isn't girthy in any respect. Now, moving closer, you can see the level of finish is world class. There's a spherical moon phase with a correction interval of 1,000 years down at 6 o'clock. Half of it is fired blue. Half of it is white palladium, and it alternates as it turns. You can see that the interior of the watch from the spring system supporting the fully polished and blued balance bridge to the actual cap atop the barrel bridge, beautifully hand executed. If you look carefully, you can see that though this is a stunning space age aesthetic, traditional finish is respected. There's Cote de Betune, like Cote de Genève, on the barrel bridge, black polish on the cover. You can see the same black polish on the triple parachute shot protection springs and the balance bridge itself. Take a quick look and you'll note that there's a fired blue track outboard of the center dial that acts as the hour track with applique rose gold polished dart style indices. If you look at the edge of the bridges, you can see that mirrored englage just as we saw on the Arnold and Son and just as we will see on the Longo Unzona soon. So the finishing quality here is as good as anything at the Haute de Gamme brands. 
they just bring more tech at Dibatun. Proprietary balance system. You can see the balance is made of titanium with white gold masses outboard. There's a flat hairspring that's two parts clamped together and bent by hand, so it develops that is breathes like an overcoil, but without the shock susceptibility and thickness of an overcoil. They use their own shock protection system. One, two, three shock protection springs for two purposes. One, durability, but also chronometry, as this system, which they call triple parachute, better recenters the balance staff to keep better time during shock conditions. You can see screws are black polished on their heads and there's even a silicon escape wheel of their own design. Over six patents protect this watch and it has a manual wind six day power reserve with refinements like sapphire inside the mainspring barrels to reduce the friction. There's a stub power reserve indicator on the dial side and when you turn the watch over, you can see that there is a more extensive power reserve indicator with a, a scale for the six days on the reverse side. You can even see the mechanism itself, which is satinated and golden and then surrounded by a lovely engine turning or perlage. This is a truly special timepiece. I think you get better value and more sophistication, both aesthetically and technically, with Dibatun than with any other company on the market. Let's talk about what's patent protected. The twin self-adjusting barrels, the process for fire bluing the titanium the floating lugs, the spherical moon face, the triple parachute shack protection system, the hairspring design, the balance design, all of this is proprietary. So when you buy a Debatoon watch, you know where your money's going. It's not going to en enrich Chanel investors, Richemont investors, Swatch Group investors. It's not going to buy castles and sports cars for some watchmaker. Denis Flajoulet at Debatoon reinvests in the product. And as the buyer, that is all to your advantage. Now, Alonco Unzona of Saxony is probably the most accomplished haute de gamme brand outside of Switzerland, while some might argue for Crador. The bottom line is that Langa, since 1994, has released watches that were trendsetters, initially forcing the Swiss to reconsider their standard of movement finish, as well as their propensity to rely oftentimes on purchased customer calibers. All of that changed with the arrival of Lanka in the 90s. And although the timepieces are very similar in profile, they're also very similar in standards of fabrication, which makes them special across the board. The screws and the bridges you get in the most basic Lanka watch are as nicely finished as those in the Grand Complication. So taking a look at what we have here, this is the Longomatic Perpetual, 30.5 millimeters in white gold. The dial itself is made of sterling silver and then black galvanized. The moon phase disc is made of solid white gold, and this perpetual calendar system does not need to be adjusted if you wear it every day until the year 2100. Now, surprisingly, for a dress watch of this style, it is also loomed, so there's an element of practicality that you don't get with a standard dress watch. The movement is the Saxomat. If you look at the seconds hand, you can see not only does it feature hacking seconds, it features a zero reset seconds system. Rolling all of that over on the reverse side, you can see this is the caliber 921 Saxomat. It has a remarkable number of refinements, but let's start out with my favorite, which is that the rotor itself is made of 21 karat gold, and then fired blued screws attach the rotor to a platinum mass. A double precious metal winding system, I have not seen that anywhere else. Look closely and you'll see both fired blued screws and polished screws, black polished escape wheel cap, black polished swan's neck regulator, German silver bridges and plates. German silver is actually nickel copper zinc. It's the same material that guitar frets are made out of, and the copper gives it that golden hue. You can also see that the balance cock has been freehand engraved. That's not done industrially or even with a rose lathe. That's done with a burin and hand. The timepiece, of course, has a 46 hour automatic winding power reserve and a rare feature for a longer watch, a full deployment clasp that was added as an option at the point of purchase. So if you're going to buy a Longomatic Perpetual, this is a wonderful example because the first owner paid most of the price to add that folding clasp and you get the benefit in that the watch becomes harder to drop while donning or removing. If you have a smaller wrist, a taste for traditional sizes, or you're looking for an absolute killer unisex option, the Longomatic Perpetual is as good as it gets. And again, a perpetual calendar, you do not need to worry about leap years or irregular length months. We're not done with Langa, not today, but what we do have, and I'm happy to bring it on, is the first appearance on Watchbox Reviews of the 2020 1000 piece limited edition, wait for it, stainless steel, Patek Philippe Calatrava 6007A. This is the 6007A or 
as it's often known, the new manufacturer Calatrava, a timepiece with a lovely blue metallic dial that has a basket weave pattern at center. Patek rather boldly describes this as a carbon fiber pattern, but I see it as more of a basket weave or a checkerboard. Now, what really strikes me here is the radial orientation of the Arabic numerals, all of which are white gold and applique. Uh, the timepiece is wonderfully colorful, charming, and it looks a little bit like their 2017 only watch. And that, that piece was titanium, but this one, likewise in a base metal with a sort of gray blue dial, is a little bit evocative of that one. Now, this watch is also loomed, and it's worth a loom shot because it is a spectacular one. That is not your average Calatrava. It's even a little bit whimsical with the radial array of the numerals themselves rather than vertical array. And it's a fairly large Calatrava as these things go. It's also a fairly durable Calatrava at nine millimeters thick and 40 millimeters with a very strong, almost squared off lug end. The timepiece is striking on the wrist. It's flat and graceful and a wonderful dress companion, but being automatic steel and so brightly loomed, this could also be considered a sports watch, not a swimmable sports watch, but sports casual, a timepiece you don't need formal attire to wear and enjoy. It could easily be the watch that you wear at the beach and the pool right up to the edge of the water. Now, of course, on the reverse side, there is commemorative imagery. Uh, the timepiece uses the 324 SC, which is a reliable anti-magnetic automatic caliber with a 45-hour power reserve and a quick set date. It's also adjusted in six positions, and it features the Gyromax style free-sprung balance. Patek guarantees this watch to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds a day. Remember, a chronometer, according to the COSC and the ISO 3159, in 24 hours will run no worse than minus four plus six. So this is minus three plus two better than a chronometer and guaranteed as such from the factory. Also, if you don't like the precious metal Calatravis and you worry about scratching easily, steel is the answer to that. Now, jumping in with a long unzona, this is a timepiece that at 40, one millimeters represents an outstanding packaging feat as there is a flyback chronograph, a moon phase, a perpetual calendar, and a remarkably deep and engrossing caliber L952 movement inside this Alonga Unzona Datagraph Perpetual. I promised you a flyback chronograph. There it is right there. Throwing the watch on the wrist, you can really see that it's substantial, but it's not overwhelming. What appears at a glance to be simply a dominating uber complication with size to match is actually fairly wearable. If you can wear an Omega Moon watch, you can wear this. They're not that different in size. They're not that different in thickness because of the thickness of the Hesalite crystal on the Omega. It's almost a body double. So while I can't offer you this watch at every location around the world to test on your wrist, I can tell you to put on a Moon watch. If you can wear a Moon watch on a strap, you can wear this. Now, the timepiece is remarkably graceful. As you can see, rose gold outside and a white silver satin dial on the inside. This is a model that came out in 2010. The original Datagraph Perpetual came out in 2006. And as with the Longomatic Perpetual, the dial here is made of sterling silver and then galvanized this silver white. And like the Longomatic Perpetual, it's loomed, which is something you might not expect. Once again, you've got that calendar that does not need to be adjusted until the year 2100. A smart feature here, when you pull the crown out, it engages a stepper system so you can move every indication on the dial. So if the watch falls four days behind and stops, you pull the crown out and then you adjust it. One, two, three, four. And everything, the moon phase, the day, the date, the month, even the leap year phase indicator, if necessary, will move forward in sync. So while you can adjust them individually using these pusher systems, it's easy to catch up should the watch run down using this coordinated stepper system. Now, I must mention that a datograph will give you the finest column wheel pusher feel that you've ever experienced. Others challenge for overall quality, but while I often mention the Zenith Caliber 400, the Rolex 4130, and the Daytona, or even the Breitling B01, those tend to feel almost brutally sharp. This 
has a little bit of silk in the system, and that's what sets the longa apart. You can also see that the case back is engrossing. You've got the same level of detail as on the Longomatic Perpetual, but with a deeper, more complex movement. You've got these overarching chronograph bridges. You've got a bigger freehand engraved balance cock, an overcoil hairspring, a feature rarely seen on longa watches. As with Jorn, it's a feature they don't often use. A huge balance, beating weight, 18,000 vibrations per hour, and black polish across screws, chronograph components, and the escape wheel cover. You've got that German silver bridge material and then glossuta stripes across the bridges. You can see better on this watch that there are chaton, golden cups that hold the pivot jewels, and then those cups are held in place by blued screws, and that's a nod to the pocket watch era. Not only is there a broad mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge, but you can also see on the edge of the chronograph components, and I'll do my best to show it, but there is a mirrored anglage on the edge of those, and because the chronograph components are made of steel, it's that much harder to achieve that mirrored bevel. Langa spares no time and no expense. This watch has it all. If you like what you saw today, reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Time out, Tim out. It's been a blast, and thanks for logging on.